It's telling me that if you do talk, pull your mic down. I thought he was talking to me. Open up the uh, City Council Workshop for February 28th, 2023 at 5.04 p.m. May I have a call to order, please? Councilmember White? Here. Councilmember Voigt? Here. Councilmember Lara? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Fenn said that he would be late. Mayor Martinez? Here. All right. Let's stand for Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. White, would you do that for me? Sure. Okay, so um, brings us to our public comment period. Do we have public comments this evening? I have no written comments. Rudy, do we have any callers on the line? I have no callers on the line. All right, seeing none, then we will go to action item C for C1, the presentation of the draft sewer system management plan, SSMP, and the fats, oils, and grease fog program and ordinance review. Introduction today, staff, Mr. Van Bell. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Yes, today we're going to have a workshop. We're going to go over an SSMP, a sewer system management plan, what it is, why we need it. And then within an SSMP is a FOG program. So we've uh, developed a program that we think uh, that you'll like. And uh, along with that will come some proposed ordinance changes from the existing uh, ordinance. So first up, we're going to start with the SSMP. Um, in the audience today, uh, we've got many of the folks that put some hard work in it and uh, did a lot of behind the scenes work. But first up, I'm going to introduce our first speaker and presenter, uh, Jim Fisher with Fisher Compliance. Jim's a registered professional engineer. He's got a BS in mechanical engineering technology and he's got 30 plus years of uh, environmental compliance with the state. So we thought he was perfect person to bring on board uh, now that he's on the other side to, to get us in compliance and move forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jim. Sure. Okay. There we go. Honorable Chair and members, uh, my name is Jim Fisher, Fisher Compliance, uh, based out of Sacramento, California. And uh, we've been in business since 2020, helping agencies like the city here with sewer system management plan compliance. So it's been our pleasure to work with the city and like to congratulate staff on all the heavy lifting, definitely heavy lifting for this uh, project um, required for the sewer system management plan or SSMP you're going to hear here tonight. I have about a 15 minute or so, 20 minute presentation for you today. Looking forward to answering any questions you have um, about the regulatory background, why we need this, information about SSMPs um, to helping facilitate your review that you're going to be doing next. Okay. So this is our website, Fisher Compliance. Um, move right into uh, the three topics I'd like to cover today. Uh, the majority is going to be on background item number one um, about the State Water Board regulation for requiring an SSMP, reasons for uh, completing it and implementing it. And then I'll end with some findings uh, for this project and some conclusions uh, for consideration. Uh, you should consider before adopting the SSMP. And really, uh, in a nutshell, these SSMP, sewer system management plans, they're very easy to write and challenging, but easy to write, difficult to implement. Uh, it takes a lot of dedication and hard work. So I can guarantee you this staff here, Dax and on down, are very, very uh, committed to this. Uh, we work with them uh, hand in hand in writing this. And uh, really, they're, they're setting up really well for an excellent plan. I might add better than most plans I've seen uh, with this, this small system like, like this. So I'll just uh, quickly point out the, uh, 
thank yous here. Daxton with his leadership calling us. Um, Lori and Sunshine behind me, uh, Jack. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation on Pat's Oils in Greece, Kevin and uh, Jerome. So um, thank you again. So I'll just start up a little bit of background about the State Water Board, um, uh, what they do, um, their mission. For a little bit of context, uh, the Water Boards is, uh, they have nine regions. Uh, you're in the Santa Ana Regional Board here in Region 8. And uh, their mission statements um, often look a lot like yours, cities, counties, special districts, um, to preserve, enhance, restore the quality of the waters, um, resources and drinking water for protection of the environment, public health, uh, all these benefits. So they really exist to protect beneficial uses of water. And so that's, that's one reason that we're here uh, with this program. I'll talk about this order. Uh, the State Water Board has been struggling with sewer spills from sewer systems for decades. And so this is really the first uh, of its kind regulation in the nation, uh, this order here, this, this 2006 uh, 003-DWQ, adopted by the board. It's a big deal. Uh, it was put in place in 2006, and I'll cover some at the end, uh, updated, recently reissued in December 2022. So we look forward to uh, helping the city with that. Uh, Come into compliance with that part. But the board itself, this is a map right here of sewage spills, maybe the last nine or 10 months. And the uh, pink are the big ones, and the other ones are the smaller ones on the map. And you can see here, it's obvious, it's a lot of spills that happened in the state. So, major causes, Greece, uh, Jack's, look, again, looking forward to hearing what he has to say about the implementation of your Fat Soils and Grease program. Uh, roots, debris structural failures, uh, and other causes of spills, and they happen a lot. Um, so I just, uh, you know, the board acknowledged that there's periodic failures, uh, the serums or sewer overflows or spills contain uh, things that are harmful for both the environment and public health, and they can cause nu nuisances and threaten aquatic life, et cetera. So the management plan is the one you're gonna be reviewing uh, here is system specific, and I emphasize that a lot of the agencies that we talk with uh, don't have specific plans like you all have now before you in this draft. There, uh, many have done plans that may or may not fit, and over time, they need to be adjusted constantly. And uh, so this is really a great uh, plan. We're very proud of it, again, working with staff uh, to take into account all these things in order. And emergency response plans are part of that plan, so you have to know how to mitigate and stop a spill and have those procedures in place. And I just emphasize these two areas, these are the 11 elements required by this uh, regulation. And the two, I think you're gonna hear about seven tonight uh, with Jack. Also, legal authority is another really big piece of this plan, this requirement and plan. And so I'll just really quickly touch on uh, these elements here. Um, the plan has to have, it's required, to have uh, prevent illicit discharges, uh, require connections, be properly designed, ensure for maintenance, inspection, repairs, limit bad soils and grease, and enforce any of the sewer, sewer uh, ordinances. More importantly tonight, what you're gonna hear more about after this is uh, how to develop and implement a fat soils and grease control program, again, required by element number six in the sewer system management plan. A, uh, implementing the plan and schedule, uh, not excluding the public uh, from the plan as well, not just commercial fat soils and grease. Um, a plan for proper disposal of the fog, fat soils and grease, legal authority, like you saw earlier, and requirements to install grease removal devices. Um, a couple others here, uh, authority to inspect those devices, um, ID sections subject to bad soils and grease, again, what you're, you're trying to do here with your implementing program, and developing source control measures uh, for all those sections above. So there's a lot of requirements. You can see here, I'll scroll back, there's what, A through G. That's a lot uh, in the fat soils and grease program. So a major part of this sewer system management plan. What about non-compliance? Um, enforcement's out there. And I just wanted to show, uh, Thaxon wanted me to show an example. This is a $1.5 million penalty issued maybe you know, 50 miles from here, the city of Bakerville, for not only spilling, spills happen, but failure to implement the sewer system management plan. So that's the reason we're here, both to avoid this kind of a thing 
uh, there's $127 million in liabilities calculated by the Water Board, and they settled for $1.5 million. Uh, this is a big, a big enforcement action. So uh, actually, the city had enforcement here. Uh, similar things back in 2009, 2010. The Santa Ana Regional Board uh, took action for eight individual sewage spills in 2009, uh, resulting from 72,000 gallons uh, discharged of surface water, and uh, failure to develop and implement the comprehensive SSMP. So we're here now to make sure that this plan is adopted and is effective in reducing and preventing sewer spills. So that was a $99,000 penalty. There was another one in 2010 for one spill, and again, they cited failure to development, implement, take the proactive steps with an SSMP. Luckily, these are behind us, way behind us in the rearview mirror now, and so these have been closed out. So the first thing we did was perform a gap analysis to take a look at what the, the city's sewer program uh, is currently doing and review those against the requirements in the order and then look for ways to suggestions. I brought in the best practice leader, Sam Rose Consulting. He's got 35 years. Um, I have the regulatory. He has a subject matter expert uh, from the industry and memorialize those findings into a report that is in your the SSMP you will be reviewing. So the first SSMP meets, I would emphasize, exceeds the minimum requirements by this regulation. Uh, we have key performance indicators in here to really help the city measure uh, their goals. Uh, unlike a lot of cities, don't really have these. These were custom built, custom designed for Beaumont, the city of Beaumont. So it was about, uh, it's about 20 or 30 key performance indicators in here that really helped ask Faxon <clears throat> under his leadership to really implement this plan and make it effective. So, um, so that's in here, and that's the one you're going to be reviewing uh, here for adoption. And it was completed in December 2022. So I might want, I'm just going to leave you with a few things uh, before we hear from Jack. Uh, on the implementation of this plan is the hard part. It's easy to write one, more difficult to implement. And insufficient pipe rehabilitation and repair is one area uh, that's very deficient still. Here, uh, the city has a plan now, but to implement that, this is an example. Uh, it's going to require future investments, substantial attention. And... Uh, the finding here, I'll just read it. The, the city currently does not have a rehabilitation replacement program to address uh, gravity pipes and manholes. Uh, the city does not uh, routinely inspect those pipes and is not able to perform condition assessment. So that's one thing that, you know, under Thaxon's leadership, again, really getting that, that rehabilitation repair program in place is going to be super important moving forward. So a couple of conclusions. The document fully complies. Um, we're there at the finish line. We look forward to your comments uh, during your review. Uh, full implementation is still lacking, I just mentioned. Uh, and the team here you know, continues to look for ways to implement and uh, address compliance gaps. So one more thing to, I mentioned earlier, there is a reissuance of this current regulation. Uh, and there's a couple of things I want to point out here that staff are going to be hustling on between now and June re-enrolling under the current order is going to expire in June. So the State Water Board is requiring everybody enrolled under this order, about 1,100 sewer systems statewide, to uh, re-enroll between April and June, uh, submit the information for the legal responsible official, that's Thaxton, he's currently the LRO, so that's also due. A couple other big things though, the Spill Emergency Response Plan I mentioned earlier has some really significant, uh, a few significant items in there to make sure the board is very adamant that up the last 15 years with this regulation, um, a lot of agencies, their inspections have revealed a lot of the emergency response plans have been ineffective. So they really put a few more things in this new order requiring more, more strings attached to the emergency response plans. And then also uploading the uh, documentation to the state's website, the California Integrated water quality system, all by June. So everybody's hustling, including, this, including your staff here. So uh, looking forward to helping them out get that done. So that's, uh, that's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. So let's um, go ahead and ask, uh, did we have any other call-ins at this time? I don't have any written requests. Rudy, do we have any callers on the line? I have no callers on the line. All right, so let's take quick um, questions um, for Mr. Um, 
Fisher. I'm going to say Flesher. I don't know sure. why. <laughs> um, go ahead and start with um, Mr. White. Uh, so we don't currently have an SSMP, correct? That's correct. And we've been fined a couple times for not having that? Uh, both for having spills and then them acknowledging not having the plan back in 13 years ago. Okay. Years ago. Has, has this, is this the first time the city's started talking about doing a plan? As far as I can recall, yes. Okay. Um, and and I, I may miss misheard you or you may have misspoke. Um, I think it, when you talked about the pipe rehair, repair and rehab, plan sure you at first it sounded like you said we have that we have that under control now or we have something in place now but then later you said no we needed to create a plan you have the plan in a document but to implement that plan and put it in place to make it effective and to make it you know get out there and inspect pipe identify problem areas that takes money time materials labor that's not in place currently and we identified that during the okay. audit so the written part's done but the Implementation. Understood. And then you mentioned near the end um, that the new order created some significant or there's some new significant issues in the in the plan of the new order. Is that something you're going to cover later or is it something you can just briefly tell me what those I issues can, are? I can briefly tell you right now. Um, yeah, so, so the board, you know, 15 years of experience basically, uh, and I worked on this order um, many years, is both in regulatory and enforcement, uh, has realized a certain limitations to how good the order is. So they've readopted it or reissued it, they say they call it in December, to address some of the noncompliance and some of the things that were ineffective in a sense, that from their view. So one of the areas is the spill emergency response plans. Um, many of the uh, agencies that um, they've inspected have not been as quick and effective and efficient to reduce spills, to stop the spills reaching waters to recover as much sewage as possible. So there is a requirement in there for uh, an accelerated monitoring requirement. It used to be able, used to be 48 hours, you'd have it to sample if you have a spill of 50,000 gallons or more. Now it's 18 hours. So that's one new requirement. There's other requirements in this order, uh, the reissued order that are, I think in the current order, there's only a few mention of you must implement this plan. There, it says it over 150 times now in this current reissued WDR that's coming in place in June. Uh, the current, uh, another example, the current uh, um, order that's effective now, between now and June that expires, it's been in place for all these decades, a decade and a half, uh, was about 45 pages, and now it's going to 80 pages. All the water code authority is list, was not listed in the current 2006 order. It is in the reissued order. So there's a lot of differences, uh, even though it is still a sanitary sewer reduction order from the state water board's perspective, there's a lot of new things in the uh, contents of the 2022 WDR coming. These being the ones I just pointed out here. So yeah, absolutely, Faxon will be working on re-enrolling the spill emergency response plan. Uh, uploading the document, this document, and hopefully will be adopted as quickly as possible into the California Water Quality System, and then designating legal responsible official. So in the short term, not bad, but in okay. long term, there are more things, a lot more things. Okay, thank you, Mayor. That's all sure. I have. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. A couple of questions. Yes, um, so we started this in December, right? Is that when we started this? I don't remember when the process started. It was earlier than that. Yeah, it, it's been much longer than that. Been, yeah, it was. It's it's been nearly a year. Okay. Our, our first effort was to get us under an audit for some level of protection upon the realization that one mm -hmm. of these did not exist. Okay. That, that second was, was to start developing one. Okay, that's what I was looking at the mm -hmm. timeline because I know we, since we didn't have one, I was trying to say how you know we started and, and that makes sense. Um, yep. Can you explain the re-enrollment process? What does that mean, re-enroll? Pretty straightforward. Um, under the current 2006 order, everyone had to enroll, submit paperwork saying, yeah, here's my, here I am, I'm a system, I'm a publicly owned system more than a mile in length. Uh, this applies to me, I want to enroll for coverage and pay my fee. This is a similar process. Um, the state has told us now they're developing a pilot program right now for making this seamless online in the California Integrated Water Quality System. We haven't seen that yet. 
uh, the regulation, we're told this will be uh, as available as of earliest, uh, early April, so very shortly. And then, you know, again, just re-enrolling okay. for coverage under that order. And then once this plan's in place, uh, obviously there'll be modifications on these orders coming up in the future. So you'd be, we'd be able to go back and modify since we have the plan. Once the plan's adopted as your LRO, I can go in and keep the document compliant with the new order uh, requirements. <laughs> It's an excellent point. I'll just add, uh, uh, Mayor Martinez, that the state was very um, careful not to make, you know, have panic. Everybody's saying, whoa, I have to do new things. So they have to do those things I mentioned early on now, for between now and June. And then there's a couple of years until these plans have to be updated. So you'll have literally two years or so okay. until the plan has to be updated and, and so forth. But right now, you just upload what you have. And then you have until 2025, I believe, to update your. So that your June plan. deadline is upload what we have. Yeah, upload what we have, and then do those other things, and okay. re-enroll and do the uh, the emergency response plan update. Good. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, we can proceed. Thank you, Jim. Thank one, you. one thing I want to make clear is, just because we have this book doesn't mean we're not ever going to have another spill again. But what it does do is take away. Uh, a lot of the liability, you, you can see that the fines in the past were accelerated um, by somebody not having a plan and not implementing it. So it, it's a, an acceleration factor to the fines. They, they, they have a, a gradient. And then the, the second part, Jim was talking about some of the changes. Um, we're going to be required to report spills down to the 50 gallon level. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those little calls we get at, at a residence where they're clean out backed up, we're going to have to log and report every single one of those. Um, also, I, I think a big part, part of it is the must-dos uh, in, in the frequency. So the first uh, order came out, and it didn't specifically say each place must do these activities. Uh, so a lot of people found uh, ways around it. If I don't look and know that I have a problem, I don't have to fix it. And now they're saying, you have to go look so you know you have a problem. And, and those, are the, those are the factors they take into account uh, when they assess spill violation fines. Is it something that you were ignoring and trying to save money by not addressing? Guess what? Your fine starts at the money you thought you saved, and then the punitive will come on top of that. Um, I think they do realize there's still going to be, you know, acts of nature, things like that are going to happen. That no matter how well prepared you are, you know, if you have a structural failure in a, you know, a metal pipe, that you know that still happens. And then, did you follow what you said you were going to do to mitigate the exposure to this bill? So I wanted to address a couple of the deficiency reports. Is this a good time, or should we can do that later? In the Absolutely. Let's just do it now. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the deficiencies that brought up the gravity pipes and manholes and that kind of stuff, so were those uh, due to funding or manpower or both? Or you know, I just wanted to know how we got to that, and then, of course, how are we? what's your plan for it? Absolutely. So there, uh, when I came on board, there was no formal assessment um, procedure or uh, replacement program. So we've talked about it for a couple of years uh, on, on how we're going to start to implement something like that. Uh, one was just to throw a generic 1% a year. That puts you on a 100-year replacement schedule. Um, the more appropriate way is to get out there and actively video camera and monitor the system. Uh, it shows the deficiencies, and then you grade them. There's a, there's a recognized grading scale in the industry how many cracks are in the pipe, how many offsets, what's the condition, the age, things like that. And then you'll sign uh, a factor to that, and that'll become your prioritization list for replacement programs. And we talked about um, cameras and stuff at one point going down in those manholes. Is that a part of something like this? Or could they be used for that, or was that for different... Remember exactly what it was for, but I remember talking about those cameras going down the, in the manholes and yeah. The city currently does not own a CCTV truck and have that equipment. Um, we have in the past had a basically an emergency contract with a, a local vendor. Um, so if there was ever an issue, they could come out, uh, kind of identify what the problem is. But it was never a full 
uh, assessment program where you go out there looking, it was more of a reactive uh, plan. So to, to address that, to, to talk about whether that might be a possibility or, you know, budget wise and so forth, is that something that will come up later? Um, That's something we're going to propose in the budget and there's different ways to, to go about it and then okay. you know, we'll take those from there, yeah. All right. And do you see a personnel issue trying to get some of these deficiencies addressed or is it more of just we need to figure it out and then what are our options and, and then go from there? So I take it you have a plan and you're working on that and you'll hear, we'll hear about yeah, it. Yeah, and it, it comes to size of scale. So, you know, as we identify the problems, then, you, you know, at, as an organization we can decide – are these things that we're going to want? Is is there enough to substantiate bringing a, a dedicated uh, staff on that's out there repairing and replacing pipeline, or are we going to contract these things out? And that all will kind of depend on the the numbers we see. And what part level. of the plan you'll have about the backup generators and stuff like that from right. the, that we talked about at the pump stations and so forth. Yes, because yeah. in, in addition to the environment issue, the the penalties are so outrageous that, you know, it, you, like you said, you can never prevent it, but having a plan in place and knowing that some of our pipes are on the older edge, you know, I'd like to see that kind of plan. It's like, okay, we know that we're going to need this many miles of piping or so forth, and, you know, whether we're going to have to look at, you know, fee study or whatever that takes. So, all right. Mayor, may I ask you a quick question? You mentioned a deficiency report. Did I miss that? Uh, that was on the... Um, it was on the PowerPoint here when we talked about the deficiencies right in here. It's the insufficients, and it could have been okay. where I read that at. You know, there's a lot of pages there. <laughs> I think. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Okay, but I think that's where I got it. Can you put that slide back up? Sure. Yeah, that's it. It's that red one. Yeah. It wasn't a report. I just okay. deficiencies mentioned in yeah, the report. Yeah, I'm going to just lost. <laughs> it's like, it was there a report I missed? Did I miss reporting all that stuff? <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Are we good for questions now? Okay. So let's continue. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. So so with that, as, as we learned, part of the SSMP is to have a FOG uh, program. And uh, to take us through that, I'm going to introduce Jack Huntsman. He's our uh, compliance officer for the city. And he's got a presentation for us on our um, fog ordinance. And within that, we, we think we're going to have some uh, really positive uh, influences for future business. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The information that I'm presenting this evening is intended to give some background and clarity as to the various types of food service establishments and their relation to the amount of fats, oils, and grease that is generated and potentially discharged into the public sewer system. I will also present a proposed um, solution for existing and future business owners within the food service industry, as well as city staff to help determine what types of food service establishments would be required to install equipment that would be that would prevent harmful discharges into the sewer system. As the environmental compliance manager for the city, working under the wastewater department, my primary responsibility is to protect the sewer system, the public sewer system, from harmful discharges from commercial, industrial, and residential sources. So for the duration of this presentation, I would like to refer to food service establishments as FSEs, just to cut down some time, and fats, oils, and grease as fog. So what is fog? Simply put, fog is fats, oils, and grease generated from the food preparation, cooking, and cleaning processes. Most FSCs to some degree generate and discharge fog depending on the type of FSC that it is and its use or lack of best management practices. These photos show what can happen when fog cools and accumulates within the sewer lines, eventually causing sewer line blockages. 
It's important to highlight here that the EPA's report to Congress identified that fog is a significant contributor to sewer line blockages. These blo blockages then result in sanitary sewer overflows, which results in untreated uh, waste wastewater being discharged into the environment. I do want to note that these photos here are not from Beaumont. <laughs> so a recent, th these photos are. <laughs> this is a fairly recent overflow that we had back in October. Uh, fortunately, um, it was in a vacant field and avoided accessing any storm drains. The photo on the left shows raw sewage overflowing the manhole, and the photo on the right shows the city collections crew pumping out that manhole to access and clear that blockage. It was determined that the only source of wastewater discharge upstream from this overflow was an FSE. And it was also determined that a faulty grease interceptor was creating the excessive amount of fats fog being discharged into the sewer lines. And I do want to note that the uh, FSE was quick to repair the grease interceptor and maintains it as required. So food service establishments. Basically, it is any, any entity where food and drink is provided to the public or other entities and could potentially generate fog to some degree. Do all food service establishments discharge the same amount of fog? No. The following here would, um, would all be considered food service establishments. It could be a gas station food mart. It could be a coffee shop, a sandwich shop, school cafeteria a care center, a fast food facility, or sit down full service restaurants. One thing that most but not all FSEs have in common is a grease removal device to capture what fog that they do generate. Most facilities have what's called an in-ground gravity grease interceptor, although there are a few facilities that have an above ground grease trap. Currently, Beaumont has approximately 100 FSEs to some various of some various types. And because some facilities share a grease interceptor and others don't have them, there are about 65 grease removal devices within the city of Beaumont. These photos here are what's called an in-ground gravity grease interceptor. This particular one has two primary round tanks there, and then the one square compartment tank next to it. Um, this one would be about a 1,500 gallon grease interceptor that is at one of our um, restaurants here in town. So what happens is in, this, in the primary tank, the grease is captured and moved to the secondary tank where it's going to capture more grease and then onto the, the uh, sample tank, which should not have any grease in it because from there, it goes directly into the um, tour lines. Again, here's another gra uh, gravity grease interceptor in ground. The primary tank's gonna have some grease in it. The secondary is also gonna have grease in it. And here it's showing that there is some grease in this particular one, which is going to go directly into our sewer lines and down to the sewer plant. This tells me that this particular grease interceptor was overdue for servicing and not being properly maintained. So you can tell by the looks of these what kind of grease, fat soils and grease is being captured before it goes into our sewer system. I also want to note that only the wastewater from the kitchen pre food prep area and the ware washing area discharged through a grease interceptor. The bathroom waste, dis, uh, wastewater does not discharge through to a grease interceptor. 
Just a side view of what I just showed you in those pictures where the inlet pipe, the water comes into the pipe and the heavy solids settle at the bottom and the fog floats to the top. Then the water, clear water then goes to the secondary compartment where you're gonna have more solids settle at the bottom, more uh, fog settling at the top, but there shouldn't be as much. And then the clear water goes into the sample tank and out to the sewer system. This particular one is a above ground grease trap, but it comes with some limitations. Uh, there's some things that, number one, you're limited to only some sinks uh, that can discharge into this. A number, you can have probably one to four sinks that can discharge into it. You're not gonna capture the, um, the floor drains or the mop sink discharge from that. And most importantly, Riverside County does not allow these within the food prep area or the wear washing area. Um, this would have to be located either outside or in another room, um, but it cannot be in those areas per Riverside County Health Department. <clears throat> so what is our legal authority to require businesses such as uh, in the food industry to have grease interceptors. They would be on the federal, state, and local level. Under the Environmental Protection Agency 40 CFR Part 403, I would highlight that the discharge of fog from FSCs is prohibited. On the State Water Resources Control Board, Within the regulations of this agency is the required SSMP, as Jim previously detailed. But within the SSMP is the required fog control program, which requires the installation and maintenance of a grease removal device. Then we have the Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority, which we refer to as SAPA. Since the wastewater treatment plant discharges to the brine line, ordinance number eight spe specifically states that fats, oils, and grease, greases are a prohibited discharge. We cannot take that material in, so then, therefore we cannot discharge it down to the brine line. Then we have the Beaumont Municipal Code. Um, I'll direct you to BMC 1309030, prohibits the discharge of fog from FSCs. <clears throat> then finally, we have the California Plumbing Code, which gives our city building department direction as to the sizing criteria of a grease interceptor. Just backing up a little bit, those in-ground grease interceptors ranged anywhere from 500 gallons to typically 2,000 gallons, but we do actually have one 6,000 gallon grease interceptor here in town. So that is shared by a multi a multi a multiple um, establishments. So that brings us to the fog discharge risk scoring system that we want to present, that staff wants to present. Given the legal mandate to implement a comprehensive fog control program and to complement and improve upon the existing municipal code 13.09 regulating fog, city staff is therefore proposing to establish a fog discharge risk scoring system. Within that risk scoring system, the kitchen equipment inventory score sheet will be used as a guide to help determine the level of risk that an FSC poses in the discharge of fog. The score sheet would then categorize various types of cooking equipment by the potential it has to generate fog. For example, high risk cooking equipment such as a deep fryer or a grill will generate more fog than low risk equipment such as a microwave or warming oven. Other factors would include, is the FSC a single service or a full service establishment? Is the FSC upstream of a sewer line hotspot location? How many seats does the, these, does the establishment utilize? These are photos here of the various categories of the equipment being used. As you can see, these are pretty much just warm only type of uh, pieces of equipment. Then the low risk cooking equipment, bread oven, pizza oven, and so on. Moderate risk cooking equipment involve a stove or a range. And then high risk cooking equipment might be a charbroiler, or a deep fryer, griddle, or grill to that extent. So 
So once, once the equipment in the FSC is inventoried on the score sheet and calculated along with the other factors, the FSC will then be categorized within the four different categories. So a category four FSC might be a coffee or juice only shop. It could be a yogurt or an ice cream shop, a sandwich shop, or a gas station food mart. Category three might be a donut shop or a pizza only store. Category two discharger would be a, faci a facility with the higher risk equipment along with other factors and, do and does already have a grease removal device installed. And then a category one discharger would be also be a facility with the higher risk equipment along with the other factors, but does not have a grease interceptor uh, or, or grease removal device installed. Once it did, then it would be categorized as a category two. Grease interceptor installation requirements. Then finally, per the proposed addition of the BMC 13.09, the requirement for the installation of a grease removal device will be based on the category that the FSC falls within. Because it is somewhat detailed, I would refer you to the specific deals, details of that proposed section in the municipal code. But basically, a category one fog discharger um, would be required to have a grease removal device installed. A category two would, by definition, already have one installed, but if it did not um, meet the conditions specified, they, would may, they may have to upgrade uh, to a device that is sufficient, engineered to that facility, uh, and designed to capture the appropriate amount of grease that it generates. Then a category three um, also shall install a grease device as long as it meets all the uh, building and plumbing code requirements. It may not be as, have to be as big as a 1500 gallon, it could be a smaller one, but it would have to meet, meet all the requirements of the building and plumbing code. So I, again, I would refer you to the uh, proposed addition to the municipal code for all the uh, specific detail uh, device installation requirements. So in conclusion, city staff is proposing to implement this FOG discharge, discharge risk scoring system, amend BMC 13.09050 definitions to include the four different categories of a FOG discharger, and adopt BMC 13.09130 grease interceptor installation requirements. So with the proposed changes to the Beaumont Municipal Code, city staff and business owners will have a clear understanding and direction as to the requirements for the installation of a grease removal device for existing and future uh, food service establishments here in the city. Okay, thank, thank you, Jack. Um, so, um, Let's go ahead and ask for a quick public comment, just to see if anybody called in. No written comments. Rudy, do we have any callers on the line? I have no callers on the line. Okay, did you want to follow up? Yeah, if I can do a quick recap. So so why did we show you all these grease interceptors and and, and all that? It's because we know you, know you represent the public and you're face of the public and, and you get these kind of questions. Um, so we want to talk a, a little bit about where we were and then where we hope to go with this. So in the past, uh, the decision was pretty much placed upon one individual arbitrarily to decide. And you can see where that would cause a lot of problems. It puts a lot of pressure on the individual. Are they making consistent decisions? What's it based on, et cetera? Uh, the city then adapted to essentially a zero tolerance policy. If the county of Riverside determined a grease interceptor was required, then we went with that recommendation regardless of any other circumstance. And uh, that was the direction. And the trigger for that was having a three compartment sink. So when you go zero tolerance, you know, there's always exceptions that kind of come up. So it would raise issues with uh, places that didn't have real significant grease discharge necessarily to the system, 
but because they had a food prep sink, the county would require a grease interceptor. And at the same time, as Jack mentioned, they don't allow them in the food prep area, so that causes some other issues. So the, the question becomes, what, what's a fair system? Uh, what do other places do? And uh, you know, one way is to literally go out and measure how much grease is in each person's discharge and are they affecting the system. Well, the big problem there is how do you present that to somebody that has, hasn't even moved into the city yet? They have a brand new business, they're considering it. What am I facing if I install my X business at this size? And that's, that's where the scoring sheet really comes in. Um, we worked with uh, Joe Jenkins with EEC and the development of this. They have rolled this out in other cities. We customized it uh, for our city. And it, it gives you a real clear direction. You can hand this to somebody that says, hey, I'm thinking of opening a coffee shop. And you can say, how many of these do you have? How many seats do you have? They're gonna come up with a score. It's gonna tell you right then and there, you need the big one, you need the, the medium one, you don't need one, and, and, and we're gonna go. And I, it's, I, I think it's one, you know, the pinnacle of, uh, of all this planning is to have something like this. So there's a clear direction for any business to know what's expected of them and, and to not necessarily require you know, extensive infrastructure for places that may not uh, need it. All right, thank you. So we'll open up to comments from questions from council. Um, so council member Voigt. Thank you, thank you both for that presentation. Um, this is all new to me, so I really appreciate uh, a lot of this dialogue and the information. I will tell you that the uh, pictures remind me of um, what the inside of a vessel looks like when you're gonna have a heart attack. So uh, to me, this is uh, very similar, I think, to what I have seen in the past with a blockage. Um, and we know the detriment that that can cause in the human body, um, and we can see what spillage can cause uh, down the way. So I think that for me, uh, that was really informative, so I appreciate that. Um, I do have a couple questions just with regards to the county's requirement that you just mentioned. Um, my assumption is that ours is more stringent um, than the county's, but can you kind of speak to the differences or how we would explain that difference uh, to maybe a new business that was looking at Beaumont as being their um, potential place? Um, and Absolutely. if that could be a deterrent um, for somebody. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll use some... Um real world examples with the, with the type of industry. So, so the county would say, if your business has a three compartment sink, you must have a grease interceptor, go to the city for an exemption. And the city really had no policy for an exemption. What we're going to do is we would look at that facility and score them. So we're actually less restrictive to the appropriate customers. So an example we had in town was somebody that so serves yogurt. Obviously they have a three compartment sink because they're doing dishes in their back room and stuff. But their discharged yogurt doesn't go into the drain. It goes, you know, they capture it and it goes into the trash. So they're not impacting our sewer, but the way the, you know, the county says you have to have one, the old way was you have to have one. And that's the existing way in, in, until something like this is adopted. So it gives us a tool to not be, and to be more business friendly and to allow those. But at the same time, certainly requiring it for your, you know, full scale restaurant, you know, and then there's triggers on here. If you have over a hundred seats, you're halfway there, even if you have nothing but microwaves. So, you know, we, it, it tries to capture a, a lot of scenarios, but overall we think it's gonna, um, take a lot of the restrictions off of the, the places that don't need it, that, that generally don't impact the system. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Hey, Mayor Pro Timpin. Yes, thank you guys, I appreciate um, what was shared. I do like the scoring thing, I think it's a good even, or easy way to kind of level the playing field amongst um, the users of that. I do have a question, is there any manual collection that's done? I, I, I think back to when I worked at Taco Bell when I was 16 and I was the, the fryer and had to 
clean out the fryer, take the bucket of grease out to the to the special grease con container. So does that still go on today? Um, and, and so how would somebody who who has a burger joint or, you know, and French fry, you know, fries and all that kind of stuff with these big, big grease bins, how do they get rid of their waste? So that type of collection, when they're when you're actually changing the fire, I've done that myself, by the way. Uh, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not well, who has it, right? <laughs> um, that that kind of collection it goes under the waste management. But that that'll never enter the system if done properly. That is collected in a specific you know uh, grease bin outside. They have a hauler for that. The grease interceptors, uh, the the capture devices that would be either in ground or outside uh, the business, uh, a pumper will come and get those on a, a routine pumping schedule that's appropriate to the size of, of the uh, device and the output of the restaurant. As you can imagine, different food establishments, even if they're exactly the same, serve the exact same number of customers by the nature of their food, are going to have different uh, levels of grease. So that's, that's one of uh, Jack's tasks as he goes out and... Uh, visits all our restaurants, make sure they're in compliance, checks their grease interceptors. You know, it's one thing to have one, but if you don't service it, it, it eventually, you know, becomes non-functional. Okay. And then the other question I have is with our efforts to try to revitalize our downtown area, it would make sense to me an, an easy solution if somebody is taking some vacant land and wants to build something on it, then there's room to put in the, the, the infrastructure that's needed. But to try to retrofit something that's existing would something like this, does it limit potential uses, you know, of, of what that may be? If somebody's looking at a particular building in, you know, downtown and says, okay, I want to convert that to a restaurant, there obviously can be some limitations, and then staff would work with them to see if that's possible, right? Um, and, and I'm sure, I guess I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with my question other than will this cause problems with, with, our, with our plan? So currently, through the incentive, the incentive programs that council just adopted and rolled out, there is, um, there is a deferral program in place that would allow businesses that needed to retrofit some additional time to get that done. So um, having this scoring sheet lets us talk to a business before they even consider building or leasing a spot and say, hey, if you're going to do food service of any kind, take a look at this, let this help determine either what kind of equipment you're gonna put in or what you're gonna be looking at from interceptor needs, right? Or addressing your, your grease output so that they can appropriately plan and make a hopefully a good business decision before they ever sign a lease agreement or intent to purchase or anything like that. Um, but with, with this giving the, the clarity up front and then with the um, incentive programs that we have in place, I think we've we've tried to balance the I guess the need that you're speaking to, which is not deterring businesses, you know, from coming in, but trying to provide an avenue for um, for either or. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Lara. Yeah, Jack. Thanks for the photos. I guess we're having salad for dinner tonight. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I appreciate the, the kitchen equipment inventory because that was one of the things that we got a lot of heat over is what, why do I have to have a grease interceptor? I'm not producing any grease. And um, so when somebody fills this out, this gives them, ideally they, they fill it out before they even sign a lease agreement so that they know ahead of time. So once this is filled out though, who tracks it? So because sometimes what, what happens is you have an individual that starts with this and the kitchen that they submit to the county ends up being different than what they told us they were going to do. Um, so my question, I guess, is does this end up becoming a part of the approved plans? And if it does, does that go out to our contract plan checkers to ensure that it becomes a part so our inspectors ensure that what they started with is what they end up with? Yes, so I, part of my responsibilities are to monitor um, that the restaurants do maintain their grease interceptors. And uh, along with the um, annual business license, I will go out and do an inspection and just to see where they're at with what they're doing. I'll, I'll kind of incorporate my inspection with a 
with the business license um, inspection. So I will, throughout the year, I will monitor what they're doing as a business as far as maintaining their grease interceptor and the required frequency because they're not always get, always going to be the same frequency. Right. So that that side view that I showed you of those in-ground grease mm -hmm. interceptors, as long as as they the combined solids on the bottom and the floating grease on top does not exceed 25%. Once it does, they have to have it pumped out. Right. It could be monthly. We have some that are monthly. We have some that are every two months. We have some that are every three, four, five, five months. It all depends. So we don't want them to, to spend any extra money than they have to, but we don't want them discharging their, their mm -hmm. fog into it. So I do the inspections and I monitor what they are doing. Um, okay. Let, let me ask this a different way. How do we ensure that what they are proposing is what they actually install? That's what I want to do is I want to make sure that we have a link. Because sometimes if you have different departments touching plans, things get lost or, you know, the owner may not be forthcoming or the architect misses something and, and then we don't catch it because it's, it's, a, it's an expensive item to install after the fact. Right. So it would be part of um, the plan check process, of course. But... Um, Earlier than that, all new business applications come through development review. So even through the streamlined process, um, planning will still take a look at it, and this is part of what okay. we will check for. So if it's a food service establishment, we know we're going to check with Jack and communicate with him and say, hey, we have this score sheet, or have you received a score sheet? If you haven't received that, let's get together, contact the restaurant, and let them know, hey, we're going to be looking for this. So based on what we receive, Plans will come in when the TI plans come through. If we have the score sheet, then okay. that can go with it. We can provide our consultants with the um, with what we're expecting to see, or plans come back around through. So people are buildings going to plan check it. Um, Public works in some cases planning will check it, and then again we can refer to does what was proposed match what's been planned and then again on the final end right they're still going out for an inspection prior to issuing the business license so as the last stop it's oh you said you were doing this but this is not reflective of what okay. we see and so then that would be a time to remedy give them the option to either put it to what complies or install an interceptor if that would be what's needed prior to signing off on the business license and receiving occupancy Okay, so the score sheet becomes a part of the approved plan, right? Um, the only thing I, I would just suggest is that I, I could appreciate what Jack is doing at the end, but when we, when our inspectors, go, field inspectors go out to do the rough plumbing installation or the mechanical inspection, um, they should check to make sure it's it's consistent with the with the checklist as well. That that way, hopefully, they can um, stop something before it's before poor Jack has to deal with it on the, on the back end. So, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, I see we've got a few there. <laughs> Council Mayor White. I was, I was waiting to see if my questions were asked by others. Save some time. Um, well, you might answer mine, so let's see. <laughs> well, I have a couple. So, uh, first of all, the spill that you showed on the uh, 10, is that, the, or right off the I-10, the spill you showed in your presentation, is that the second time that's it's we had a spill there second time in that area but completely unrelated causes okay cuz i don't remember i remember the one that was a lot longer than 4 4 like months that. ago yeah so i didn't see I want to say that one was about 5 years ago right yeah. right okay um do we consider people who are running um food prep businesses out of their homes fses <laughs> I have, that's good because I have more question no, related to. Well, um, we all have FSEs within our homes, and they're called kitchens. Right. And so, yes, that it. We don't inspect health. The county health department does, but I cannot. The only thing that I can do on the residential side is educate. Um, but I can't go into a house and make have them install a grease intercept because they're not required to. So if somebody came in to open, say, a cookie shop, and we told them you need to make this investment in FSE, they just start cooking cookies at home, and we now have no 
insight over to what's going into our sewer system. And what we're doing, starting to do, is uh, whenever we have a home-based business, is start looking downstream into the manholes to see if there is a problem with the grease. We, we can look. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking about my arteries at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we would hope the scale wouldn't be, you know, in, right. in a home versus, versus an establishment, but po point well taken. And, and, you know, to, to sort of piggyback on uh, Mr. Finn's comment, if you have a business in downtown who now, because the score sheet says that they need an outside or an in-ground um, grease interceptor, the ones that you showed, what are, how much room do they take? Uh, what are the dimensions, do, if you have any idea? In other words, how big a hole are they going to have to dig to be able to put one of these items in? I don't have the exact dimensions of it, but it, it is a significant uh, number one investment to to put one of these in, and it does require um, adequate space to do that, as well as access to the plumbing itself. Do we have any um, estimate of a, of a cost for one of those? I was told that a recent one that was done locally here in the downtown area. The unit itself was about $8,000, and by the time you have it installed, it totaled about $20,000. <laughs> and um, you, you brought up the, the example, or you mentioned there's a 6,000, I think 6,000 gallon interceptor that's shared. Can you give me an idea um, of how, how it's being shared? In other words, is it three or four businesses that are in the same building? Is it different build and you know they can pipe them all together or sort of explain to me what the shared it would be is. like in a strip mall where there's one building but they're all different facilities um, separate business entities okay so and, each separate and, entity would just need access to the 6,000 gallon but they wouldn't all have to have their own in in store grease interceptors that is correct and we do not allow shared grease interceptors anymore Oh, you don't? Okay. Um, and that's all I had. Did I ask any of your questions? Just one. Oh. One out of four. <laughs> so, but that's not bad. Um, so on the above ground interceptor, is there a maximum size that business can have, according to the county limit, maybe? Those are engineered specifically to flow and not so much the... Uh, the gravity grease interceptors are, are designed per drainage fixture units in a facility. So a, an above ground hydromechanical type is engineered for flow. And so that's kind of like a different uh, way of determining the size for that. So it, again, it would have to be engineered specific to that facility. And I noticed on the score sheet that there's no accountability for size of the equipment or frequency of use. So if someone that has a small fryer or a large fryer is graded the same. But I assume that's probably balanced by the number of seats that the unit has. Is that correct, maybe? Yes, I would say so, yes. Okay. Because so I can see someone having a small fryer and getting the same score as someone that has a, you know, triple fryer, you know. But... Um, I mean, like I said, it'd probably be balanced. You wouldn't have a large fryer unless you have a larger establishment, I would assume. Um, the penalties, I was concerned about penalties for noncompliance, but now that you mentioned um, the building uh, permit, the uh, business permit tied to that, and I assume that could also be an incentive for, um, or I guess we use as a penalty. If you don't have it in compliant, then we're not going to give you your license until you get a compliant type thing. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the with new businesses coming in, that would be the, the way we would handle it. With existing businesses that Jack's currently working with, um, I can see that being an issue possibly down the line, but I'm not sure now how many we have left that we're dealing with that maybe need interceptors that we, that we don't have. It's not very many. I think we've been and, working and making and progress on the list. you mentioned most of your interceptors have a schedule for pumping anyway. Yes. Correct. So, because you know, sometimes you, if it costs a lot, some I can see where some businesses might really take it to the limit to get as much as they can with it, and then we have to pay that price. And, that is correct. They, they all they range from just depending on the the establishment. They range from, um, like I said, anywhere from one month every month to 
every six, nine months. We have one facility that does it every nine months just because they don't generate. They have a grease interceptor, but they don't generate that much uh, to where it's required to. And I'm assuming that if we found that there was a FSC that contributed to a fault or something that caused something on our end, even to an extent where we are penalized or having to pay a penalty for our sewage overflow, is, are they on the hook for any of that? The city at its discretion can push the cost to the FSC if they can be uh, identified as the difficult reliable. Yeah. But, okay. But I'm just saying, though, with the penalties going up and at 50 gallons. Gen so generally, we're looking for compliance. I mean, yeah. if, if you have, you know, if you really have a bad actor, then, you know, we're going to go down that road. But, you know, initially what, what we're looking for is, is compliance. And I'm assuming that as much as we inspect and so forth, you'll know who are the frequent flyers that aren't, like, yes, going to be so. <laughs> okay. All right. That's all my questions. Any more from council? Yes, Mayor, one more. I just had a couple more. Thank you. Um, based off of the category level, is there, like, a policy or something that will be put in play to state? You would be expected to get X amount of kind of... Um, I don't want to say surprise visits or inspections. It, will it be based off of the category on uh, kind of establishing what we would be reviewing those uh, certain FSEs at? Or is it based off of grease usage from what I heard or production, so, I guess? Uh, how my inspections work, uh, typically it's, it's yearly, annually with these. But I do, like I said, I do monitor their maintenance uh, requirements. So what, what I require in our municipal code is very clear. Let me, let me point out that our municipal code is very clear about the maintenance requirements of these grease interceptors. That's one thing we have, definitely have going for us in that. Um, and it's also clear that I can require documentation that they are getting it serviced. So what I'm doing is having the, the waste haul company send me the documentation when they do mm. service that grease interceptor. Or the, the establishment itself will send me what, um, that documentation. So again, using the municipal code, I can require and request that they provide proof that they are getting it serviced. And when it's documented on that, on that waste manifest or that form, it'll tell me, typically it'll tell me, what the percentage of fog and solids is. So if I can see that it's 40%, then I know that they have to increase their frequency. Very good, thank you, I appreciate that. And then one other question I have is, uh, kind of along the lines of what uh, Council Member White discussed is, um, where do our mobile kind of food trucks uh, kind of come into play with this? I know it's kind of like a, oh. so, um, so in the food truck ordinance, they are required to uh, retain and um, dispose everything not in our, it's called out in our um, ordinance mm -hmm. that they can't just dis discharge into our system. They have to collect and then have um, some other means of disposal. So whether they haul it or, you know, take it somewhere and dump it or have a collection company come and pick it up. Um, that's what they're, that's what they're required to do. Um, as far as the pop-up vendors and whatnot, um, so our non-motorized vendors that are SB 946 compliant, um, which are like your um, typical, like the fruit vendors or your um, the guy on the bike that rides around with the pinwheels mm -hmm. and the slushies and that the, the corn guy, um, they don't no they don't have fog, right? Yeah. So um, there's not anything there. The non-compliant ones, um, we we deal with through um, code enforcement code or PD um, matters. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah, last question. How are we trying to address uh, developers that come in and they want to develop shell suites, right? Um, is there a way to let them know ahead of time that if you plan on doing a restaurant, you need to allow for space for a, a grease interceptor? I know that they're sized based on fixture units, right? Yeah. Or what you're, what you're going to be cooking with. So, because that always ends up being a, a tug of war, right? The 
the new the leasee doesn't want to spend twenty thousand dollars to put in a grease interceptor for the for the owner of the property. So, yeah, so that's something that's addressed when um, we're looking at it through the development review process again okay. through DRC, which. Um, wastewater and, and Jack participate in along okay. with all the other departments. Um, part of the reason why we do have a number of the older strip centers with the shared right. interceptors are because a lot of times one was put in because they were developed as, as shell buildings, not knowing who was going in, but a land or property owner wanted to be prepared in case there was restaurant. Now they're advised ahead of time, shared interceptors are not permitted. Um, and, and once this is adopted in the Ordinance is updated at council um, later next month. Um, this will be something that we will include with packets or anybody that inquires. This is something that we can hand and oh, say, excellent. hey, you know, be aware. This is the scoring sheet. You, Mr. Developer, if you're going to, you know, build your building, know that no shared grease interceptor. So either you won't be able to have a restaurant in there or you'll have to be prepared okay. or your tenant will have to know ahead of time that one would have to be installed if you meet. Okay. the criteria established here. So we're doing a much better job, it, it sounds like, and I appreciate that, of educating the applicants up front rather than after the fact. So that's great. Good good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions or discussion, go ahead and take it away. What would you like from us? Well, thank you. So with this, obviously, will come some proposed ordinance changes to incorporate all of this. And a couple of the things we're looking for direction on is, is what we you know, want to list as a reasonable timeline if we find that category one, you know, the, the place that should have the big proper grease interceptor and doesn't. Um, so we're looking for council direction on the reasonable timeline to achieve that. Um, staff discussion, um, this recommended 180 day, but we're definitely open to council's input. We know if, if you go 90, sometimes just going through the process puts you right up against it. We also know sometimes, you know, if you go too long and somebody doesn't act until the day before, that, you know, you've already had six more months of them, you know, noncompliance and, and they're not going to be ready the next day. So that that's one of the areas we're looking for direction on what we want to list in the, in the ordinance as, as a reasonable timeline. And if you look at your... Um the the red line changes for the proposed or the red line of the proposed changes for the fog ordinance is included in your packet um, chapter 1309 we actually for category one had dropped in a nine month um, timeline the first 90 days was the time allotted for them to get plans in and then 180 days after that to actually get it get the work done but again that's just staff sort of preliminary where we're at with things we're open to discussion but I think across the board we feel like that's a fairly reasonable timeline um, and then we can carry that timeline through for the various other categories but um, category one being the the heaviest discharger um, we drop that in okay um, as well as the wording I believe you'd mentioned on that conclusion. You're looking for direction on, um, of course, the definition, um, correct? It would actually be for all of the red line There's changes in there. Those the were two lines. of the, oh, the okay. primary ones, but there is actually a, a, all of the red line included there would be what would come back for a first reading for council. Um, I believe we're aiming for the March 21st council meeting. Okay, um, including the adoption of the scoring sheet. Correct. Okay. Comments from councils. Uh, Council Member Void, is that light from this one? That is. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll go with you. Uh, I definitely like the addition of the um, the definitions and the updates. I, I would recommend that uh, those move forward. I do have a question regarding this essential kind of like a nine-month uh, notification. Do we know of any supply chain issues? I mean, is this adequate? Is the I mean, have there been any any members or I don't want to say members. I guess customers that can't meet this timeline um, that would we would foresee pushing them further. The experience that I've had with the recent ones that have been put in within the city that's that's adequate time. It's adequate. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Laura. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mayor. So maybe I'm looking at this one. The, the number or the category one fog, isn't that for like a, wouldn't that be for a, let me see. Hang on. I need to go back up. Category four. Okay. Never mind. I was backwards. Category four is for like a subway or something like that that wouldn't require one. And then category one is mm -hmm. a heavy user. So I, I like the time frame. Um, it shows one is, is they've got 90 days to show that they're sincere about trying to come into compliance. And then they have 180 days to get through the plan check process, order their grease interceptor. And then, uh, and then obviously, I think if there's supply chain issues, it's something that we would work with as long as they're making the effort to comply. So I like that time frame. I think that's um, fair and keeps those that are honest uh, on point and those that are trying to circumvent the system gives us um, the opportunity to go back out and make sure that they're monitoring because of the potential penalties that the city would face. So I, I, um, I like that. Thank you. So you're proposing keep the nine months total? to do the the 90 day notification the, the yeah the 90 with the submittal of plans and then another 180 days to okay and you are okay with the scoring sheet yes I think that's great. and you commented also council member white you were okay with the scoring sheet right. any other comments i myself am fine i think that's reasonable i all too thought about issues with building and I mean, it's taken us years to get a signal light pole, so, you know, I don't know what's yeah. going it's on a, with that, but, point. Yeah. I, you know, as long as they're in communication, I mean, right. things like that can be, you know, obviously extended if needed. So I'm okay with the time frame and the scoring sheet as well. Any other comments, support, or at least a yes, I'm good on all? Yes, I'm good on all. That'll take it. <laughs> all right. And it's a nod from Mr. White as well. So I think we're good. Yeah, well, thank you very much with that. I think that uh, concludes our presentation. And uh, you'll be seeing these items uh, come forward at future council meetings for adoption and readings. All right, very well. Excellent job. It. Thank you, Mr. Fisher, as well. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, seeing no other comment from staff or council or so, I'll um, adjourn the meeting at 6.21 p.m. Oh, that was more. There you go. <laughs>